Hello, today our goal is to talk about American involvement in World War I. Uh, of course, in world history, you've probably talked about how other countries in the world have dealt with World War I, uh, but now we'll talk about what America's role in that war was, uh, because early on, we, we didn't have much of a role at all. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I'd like you to do, uh, either for homework or in class, uh, is to do the article, American Expeditionary Forces. That will give you a pretty good background of what America was doing during World War I. So we start with the mobilization. Um, America, prior to World War I, does not have a very big military at all. In fact, our military is kind of tiny um, before 1917, so before the war broke out, and even after the war broke out, we had about 200,000 people in our military. Now, to give you an idea, this is not the largest military in the world. It's not even number one, two, three, four, or five. Um, in fact, uh, even Belgium has a bigger military than the United States. Uh, Russia's got 5.9 million, Germany 4 million, France 3.9 million, Austria 1.8 million, Italy 1.1, Britain 630, Serbia 240,000, Belgium 220,000, uh, Montenegro uh, 50,000. Uh, right before Montenegro, you would have America at about 200,000. So again, our military, you know, we think of America as having the biggest, baddest military in the world today. Uh, we have one of the largest military forces in the world and certainly one of the most well-trained. It wasn't that way in the years leading up to World War I. Because remember, prior to World War I, we were very isolationist. We were very hands-off. Um, we, we were kind of maybe a little bit economic intervention in the rest of the world. But as far as actual military involvement goes, uh, we had no intention of getting involved in world affairs. So America leading up to World War I um, didn't, really, didn't really have a lot to go by. And so once we actually do declare war and once America enters the war, uh, there are a lot of people who volunteer to join the war. Over 2 million people will volunteer in and just join because they want to. And that's going to significantly boost the size of our military. But even that is not going to be enough in order to fight the war. We're going to need more than that. Enter the Selective Service Act of 1917. Uh, the Selective Service Act of 1917 essentially is what today we would call the draft. And in 1917, uh, anybody between the ages of 21 and 30 could be drafted for the war. And so that's exactly what they did. Looking at some draft papers for some soldiers during uh, World War I, um, we're going to have over 24 million people who are going to register for the draft. Uh, out of those 24 million who register, uh, 3 million will actually be drafted. 3 million will be drafted to join the war effort. So we've got 3 million who are drafted, another 2 million who enlist. Uh, so we've got about 5 million people in the American military. Now that is a pretty sizable force. Reflection question for you. Uh, how would you feel if you were drafted to serve in the military? Uh, today, I, I think we look at war a little bit differently. Most people are not really anxious to go to war. Uh, but when World War I broke out, um, at least once America decided that we were in, uh, after the three factors, after the sinking of the Lusitania, after the failed Sussex Pledge, and after uh, the Zimmerman note, uh, Americans are pretty much on board with the war. Uh, very few people will try to dodge the draft. Very few people will try to avoid the war. Uh, in fact, most people just pretty willingly go out of sense of patriotism, out of a sense of what's that word we use? Ah, yes, this is nationalism at its finest. And so when we have the draft, when we have conscription, we've got a lot of nationalism going on. And so, again, American, American soldiers, um, we're going to be a little bit different than the French, a little bit different than the British. And um, we know that in France and Great Britain, by this point in time, most soldiers are pretty tired out. Uh, war has been dragging on since 1914. We're into 1917. We've got a lot of stalemate going on in the war. So most people who are fighting the war, they're, they're sick of the war. Uh, enter the Americans. We, we haven't been fighting, and we haven't been attacked on our home soil. And so when Americans join the war effort, we're pretty excited about it. Um, we've got a pretty good attitude about the war, and most Americans, not everybody, but most Americans are pretty enthusiastic for joining the war. Most Americans are pretty okay with going to fight in World War I. They see it as their sense of patriotic duty. There are a few people who decide that they are not going to fight in World War I. Uh, they do this for a number of reasons. These people are called conscientious objectors. Uh, what that means is that they don't actually have to go fight in the war. 
and you can do this for moral reasons if you say, um, look, uh, uh, from a moral or a religious or a philosophical point of view, uh, I, I can't kill somebody, I can't take the life of another man, uh, you could register as what's called a conscientious objector. Altogether, there weren't very many of them, about 3,500 men total, um, but those people who were conscientious objectors, uh, they were usually, you didn't get out of going to war, you just got out of fighting on the fronts, which I guess is the most dangerous part of the war, but still, um, you know, you, you, you'd still have to go. And so a lot of conscientious objectors served on the medical corps, a lot of conscientious objectors served as parachuters, um, fighting fires, uh, and then, and, but see, here's the thing, if you were a conscientious objector, uh, usually you were not looked on favorably. You were often criticized by people within the United States and people within your troop. And I just love this political cartoon. Uh, the quote is, well, the shot and shell are flying, and the mighty cannons boom. He is tied in up the trenches with a dustpan and a broom. Uh, yes, conscientious objectors not looked on very favorably, um, often made fun of. Uh, or another one, conscientious objectors, the gentlemen with the consciences require no swords or guns. They're going to win by singing love songs to the Huns. Uh, the Huns, of course, another name for the Germans. And uh, again, we see things don't go too well with those people who decide that they're not going to fight in the war. And so, once again, conscience objectors often criticize. I think it's important to note that uh, African Americans were permitted to serve in World War I. Unfortunately, our military is still segregated at the time. And so, uh, the 400,000 African Americans, all volunteers, uh, will, will not serve with white people. They'll always be in separate regiments. And oftentimes, they will not get credit for what they, they have done. Uh, oftentimes, they they will step up to the plate when they're needed. Uh, in fact, in the later parts of the war, when we really need African Americans to fight, they prove that they are valiant and as good of fighters, if not better than the, than the standard white fighter. Um, but still, there were a lot of African Americans early on who did show that sense of pride and patriotism in fighting. Now, keep in mind, this is at a time when we've got Jim Crow laws in America. So in America, these men don't have equality, but they're willing to show their love and patriotism for America by fighting in the war. Uh, women. Uh, so women were not officially allowed to join the military as soldiers. Women were not allowed to fight in World War I. However, over 20,000 20, women will end up serving in what is known as the Army Nursing Corps. So they will go over and they will serve as nurses and, as, and help uh, in, in the war effort. I'm never going to quiz you on it, but to give you an idea of what a typical soldier was making at the time, an American would have been paid about $33 a month in order to fight in the war. Uh, that's the equivalent of $505 a month today. Uh, so you're not making your millions fighting the war. This is not great money in the war effort. However, it's still a little bit more than the Germans. Uh, German soldiers making 19 Deutschmarks are about the equivalent of $5 a month, $77 a month today. Um, why are Germans making so little? Because most of them were conscripted into the military. Most of them were drafted, and they didn't really have a choice. They had to fight, uh, or they could be put in jail. As far as the uniforms go, uh, soldiers' uniforms would change significantly during World War I. And as these original color photographs of the Marne show, some soldiers' uniforms owed more to the parade ground than to the needs of camouflage. There were easy targets in the early months. The Germans were in a shade of field gray, but the British were even more difficult to spot, as another German enviously noted. The color of the English clothing is much more suited to the terrain than ours. It's a sort of browny green, a really dirty color. This really is an advantage, although we're still going to win. Uh, American soldiers sometimes were called doughboys. Uh, they got that nickname because of the buttons on their jackets. Some people said that they looked like uh, the, the, the middle of a donut hole. So the American soldiers often nicknamed doughboys. Uh, this is the typical uniform that a member of the United States military might wear. Uh, Marines had a slightly different uniform, uh, but still same general thing. And you can see this guy is prepared with a gas mask. 
Uh, the British soldiers were called Tommies. Uh, so when you went to sign up for the military at the time, uh, there was always a, uh, a sample on the enlistment form. And the sample, uh, there, the, the sample name you used was a guy named Tommy. And so because of that, the British military often called Tommies. And then the Germans, uh, the Germans uh, would wear these cool looking helmets. Um, the helmets actually serve no military purpose. Uh, so some people think, uh, do they use that spike to ram it into people? They do not. It's more of just a, a look of elegance. It's more of a classic look. So uh, German soldiers would have worn a helmet like that. And uh, the German soldiers, sometimes by the Americans and the British and the French, they were called the Huns uh, after Attila the Hun. And this is not a term of endearment. In fact, this would be a criticism. This would be a way of making fun of the German soldiers. Uh, as far as the American forces go, uh, the American forces were sometimes known as the American Expeditionary Forces or the AEF. They were led by General John J. Pershing. Uh, there's a high school in Detroit named after General Pershing, uh, Pershing High School. And uh, when, when he comes in, he decides that he is going to play a major role in reshaping. He's got to figure out what role America is going to play in the war effort. And um, so, again, we, we know that American military is not very strong heading into the war. Now we've got to decide what is the role of the American military going to be. We know the American military uh, is, is put together a sizable force. But when America decides to enter the war on April 6, 1917, uh, the Germans do not think that the Americans are really going to make that much of a difference. They figure it's going to take months and months and months, if not years, for the Americans to train and then eventually get overseas, uh, mostly by boat, in order to fight the war. Uh, the Germans miscalculate significantly because, first of all, America finds a way to send over 10,000 troops per day. It turns out the German submarines are not nearly as effective as the Germans think that they're going to be. Uh, so the Germans were planning on taking out a whole lot more Americans on the way over. And it turns out that America is able to move a whole lot quicker than the Germans had ever expected. And so by the time things are done, um, the American military is going to make their way in and they are going to put a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of pressure on the Germans. Now, when the Americans first came over, the original strategy and one of the, the big debates was going to be, should the Americans just simply reinforce the British and the French or should we fight on our own? And the British and the French just wanted us to join their troops altogether. Uh, however, uh, General Pershing said, no, 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 no. If we're going to fight, we're going to fight on our own. So when America first got there, we did help reinforce the British and the French troops, at least early on in the war. But as America had more troops over and once we had a full... Um, a full group of men over there ready to fight. Eventually, we would start to fight the battles independently on our own. And so we're going to focus on the American battles of the war. Now, when it comes to the test, don't, don't get too caught up on every detail of every little American battle. I'm not going to quiz you on what happened in every battle, but I do think it's important to note that the role that America plays in this war that's been drawn out, that's had a lot of, uh, a lot of deadlock throughout the course of most of the war. We've had this stalemate going on. Um, what we're going to focus on now are some of the key American battles, just in case you ever see them on trivia questions or, um, you know, it's, it's not bad to know what America was, was doing at the time. All right, so the first time America gets involved in the war, the first real battle that we get involved in uh, on our own is the Battle of Chateau Thierry. Uh, Chateau Thierry is the first U.S. offensive it's part of the Battle of the Marne, and so the Battle of the Marne has been going on for years. It's one of those areas where there's a whole lot of stalemate. Uh, Americans are going to kind of come in, and uh, we are going to join the British and the French, and we're going to attack using a strategy known as the Rolling Barrage. And this is the way the Rolling Barrage works. Uh, you've got to basically time things perfect. You're going to fire a bunch of artillery, which is going to create a cloud of smoke, and then you're going to run in to no man's land because nobody can see you because of the smoke. And then you'll continue to do this. You'll fire the artillery ahead of yourselves to create a barrier, and you'll use that to hide yourself on the way in. We're caught by enemy machine guns. The result was abject slaughter. To adapt, all of the belligerent forces adopted a refined artillery tactic called the rolling barrage. 
It was an intricate and dangerous operation where the charging riflemen would tuck in as close as possible behind a pulverizing curtain of high explosive cannon fire that advanced from the line of departure towards the opposing defenses at a prearranged rate. Precise coordination between infantry and artillery decided success or disaster. The advancing wall of shrapnel, smoke, and flying dirt kept the enemy's head down and obscured their view of the approaching foot soldiers until it was too late to defend themselves. The assault companies had no radios. Wristwatches were synchronized. Thousands of meters away, the artillery advanced the rolling barrage in predetermined degrees to push the wall of covering fire forward, according to a rigorous plan that commanders determined by the terrain, the enemy defenses, and the stamina of their infantrymen. Once the bombardment began, teamwork and fighting spirit possessed the young So there you have it, the Battle of Chateau Cari, a huge victory for the Allies, a huge victory for the Americans, um, which brings us to the Battle of Bella Wood. Uh, the Battle of Bella Wood is actually part of the Battle of Chateau Cari. Uh, it is uh, where the Marines are going to come in, and they're going to have this, this area of Bella Wood, uh, um, which is a, a really nasty terrain to make it through. Uh, things have been kind of blown up by the ensuing stalemate that's taken place and eventually they're going to have to make their way through a lot of thick grass, a lot of thicket, a lot of um, rocks and boulders and then eventually through the woods of Bella Woods and they're going to do this well. The Germans are attacking using a lot of gas, a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of gas attacks and there's a, also a lot of artillery fire. Uh, what makes the Battle of Bella Woods one of the nastiest battles of the war is that it's mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, because once the Americans encounter the Germans, they're, they're not going to be fighting from a distance using artillery. They're not even going to, well, they're going to shoot at each other when they can, but it, it turns out to be a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. So again, uh, one of the, the nastiest battles of the war, and Americans are going to take heavy casualties during Bella Wood. Barry had 400 yards of open wheat field to cross in the face of a galling fire. I did not believe he could ever reach the woods. Major Barry forms his battalion into two attack companies of four waves, each man five paces apart. Two other companies follow 200 yards behind. The Allies had designed this formation to closely follow a rolling artillery barrage that would screen the advance. But the brigade commander, seeking to surprise the enemy, orders only a brief barrage, a fatal error. German gunners open a murderous crossfire. Marines fall by the score. Chicago Tribune correspondent Floyd Gibbons, hit by three bullets, files an eyewitness dispatch. The surviving Marines abandoned the parade ground formation and began advancing in Russia. A squad would run forward 50 feet and drop. Another squad would rise from the ground. German machine guns fire relentlessly. Each desperate dash incurs more casualties. Fully half the battalion goes down. Decimated squads grimly keep moving, firing, moving. Mere handfuls reach the woods to bayonet the machine gunners, but they are too few to hold. Two adjoining battalions fare better, but the overall cost has been staggering. The Marines on this single day lose more men than in their entire history up to that date. Colonel Catlin would later write, This bitter struggle marked the turning point for this whole war. The battle for Below Wood continues for three more bloody weeks until June 26th, when Major Maurice Shearer reports, Woods, now U.S. Marine Corps, entirely. As you can see, the Battle of Bella Wood wasn't won because of our superior strategy uh, or because of the superiority of our military. It was won because of our pure determination. America wanted to win, and even though we struggle at first, because we keep going, because we never give up, because we never give in, uh, we're able to win that battle. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is the Battle of St. Mihiel. Uh, the Battle of St. Mihiel is the second American offensive, um, this area that's just east of Paris. Uh, becomes a major industrial zone, and this is the first time that America is actually going to work on our on our own. So during the previous battles that we've talked about, we were working with the French, we were working with the British. Uh, this time, we're going to be on our own, 
American, we're going to attack German trenches. And so again, in the battle, we, we see Pershing is going to have to fight through a lot of rain, a lot of mud. It gets to the point where tanks end up getting stuck in the mud. Uh, this is one of the early times that the Army uses the Air Corps. Uh, today, what we would know as the Air Force in order to fight battles. Um, but uh, even though it's kind of nasty conditions that we're fighting in, we end up um, really just outmaneuvering the Germans. This ends up being a, an easier battle than we thought it was going to be uh, because it turns out that the German artillery, they're not attacking where they probably should be attacking. They've missed a lot of their targets and they haven't done a good job of defending their zone. And so we're able to achieve all our objectives and win that. Uh, the third battle in one of the major battles of the war is the Battle of Meuse Aragon. Uh, this is going to be the largest American offensive. We're going to have over half a million troops fighting, 22 different divisions. And the Battle of uh, Meuse Aragon takes place. Uh, Meuse, the name of the river. Argon, the name of the forest. And so the goal of this is to break through that Hindenburg line. The goal is to break through this, this line of, of stalemate and really try to capture a German train hub. And if we can do this, if we can move forward, uh, then we're basically, by taking that train hub, they won't be able to, they won't be able to restock their, their ammunition, they won't be able to restock their troops, and uh, the end result will be we'll, we'll have a huge advantage in the war from that point on. And so it turns out that in the Battle of Meuse Aragon, uh, the Germans are on the retreat, the American Marines will follow, and eventually um, we're going to win. One of the more interesting things about the Battle of Meuse Aragon is that um, by the time the Americans finished their advance, the Central Powers had already surrendered. They had already given up. And so many of the American troops kind of got caught off. Communications weren't great in 1918. And so they didn't exactly get the message that the war was over when the war was over. Uh, one big thing about the, the Battle of Meuse Aragon, we see the debut of one of the deadliest weapons in American history and probably what is considered one of the better rifles in American history, the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle. Um, and so it's, it's going to be a, an interesting tool that's going to help us push us forward in the war. And this is a Browning at play. You can see high-powered weapon, high-powered shells uh, shooting in rapid succession. It's a far cry from some of the early weapons used at the beginning of the war. So we're going to watch a video in class about uh, a group known as the Lost Battalion. They're the 307th Infantry Division and the 77th Inf Infantry Division. And uh, what ends up happening with the Lost Battalion, uh, they're led by a guy named Charles Whittleseed. Uh, he originally was a lawyer who eventually goes on to serve in the military. and uh, well, basically, as you're going to see in the movie, um, they are told that there are people on their flanks. They're told that the French and the British are going to help them out. It turns out that there's nobody on their flanks, and they get lost in the Argonne Forest. It turns out that they are the only group in the Battle of Meuse Argonne to complete their mission. Um, most of it happens after the, the war is over. Um, so after a really, really nasty battle, uh, one of the things that America is going to do is, is that we're going to... Um, we're going to see that they emerge and, and they come out pretty scarred based on the battles. Uh, Whittleseed, his idea of the military has changed and uh, it shows us sort of the, the difference between the men fighting the battles and the decisions made by the leadership at the time. Uh, so there, there were people who ended up surviving, but to this day they're known as the Lost Battalion. When it comes to Ending World War I, um, eventually things go pretty nasty in Germany. Uh, they start to run out of food because so much of the, 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 the food and the supplies and so much of the German strength is going to fight the war uh, that eventually they, they couldn't fight back. The Allied tanks were better than they had anticipated. And so food riots start to break out in Germany. The German citizens don't support the war anymore, and it's at that point when they turn on their own government, they, they basically demand uh, that the leadership of Germany be turned over um, because they, they feel like they're just being betrayed by their own country. They feel like their country is not helping them, 
and eventually Germany in 1918 is forced to surrender. Uh, they are forced to give up their part of the war, and with that, uh, World War I will be over once the armistice is signed on November 11, 1918, at 1111, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more on that uh, later on in the unit. We'll talk more about the surrender and the outcome of it. Uh, but yeah, that's World War I for you. Have a wonderful day.